Hello, everybody. My name is Ernest Owens, author of The Case for Council Culture, and you're tuned in to Rolling Out, Meet the Author. What's going on, everybody? Back again here for Rolling Out, Meet the Author, and today I have another amazing author with me. Today, I'm speaking with Ernest Owens. He is the author of The Case for Cancel Culture. Cancel culture, y'all. This is big. This is big. Ernest, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I can't complain. I'm super excited to be here. Definitely, definitely, and I'm glad that you are here speaking with us, man. Like I said earlier, man, we 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 share a bond. We share an NABJ bond. <laughs> so yes. this is be cool. But with all that aside, sticking to the book, The Case for Cancer Culture, let the people know what this book is about. Thank you. Um, it's my first book. It's an adult nonfiction book, and I am basically redefining what cancer culture is and what it has been. Um, I look at it as a democratic tool um, for the for those who are on the margins um, to speak truth to power, to call for accountability. You know, I don't see it as something that is only a conservative issue or a liberal issue. I, I see it as something that is a people issue, and I see it as something that is misunderstood and misguided. My book is ambitious. You know, I, I don't hold any punches. I I argue that cancel culture, the way that we we assume it to be and what we don't, has been around since. Adam and Eve, you know, Adam and Eve were probably the first people to be canceled, you know, um, and, and ever since then from Joan, you know, Joan of Arc, from, you know, the Salem witch trials, all of these moments in history, um, people were being canceled, people were being persecuted, people were, were, were being challenged, and I don't see council culture as being super positive or super negative. I think there's a wrong connotation that's really been defined by the most powerful and privileged people amongst us. Um, it's a dog whistle, to be honest, when people want to challenge authority. And I think that, you know, when we before there was council culture, there was PC culture. Before that, you know, there was, you know, the red scare. There was all these labels to try to scare dissent. And so I think this book is an opportunity to level the playing field, to provide a different nuanced perspective on it. Um, this is the first book of its kind being published by a major outlet like Macmillan and, and St. Martin's Press to really challenge people's thinking on council culture outside of this negative binary. I love that. And, you know, I want to ask you, what moment were you like, I got to write this book? Was it, was it somebody that got canceled? Was it just a, a plethora of things? What was it where it's like, okay, I got to sit down and I got to write about this? Thank you. Um, in the introduction of my book, the first chapter, I, I, there's two moments that stick out to me. One was in 2019 when I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times criticizing Obama, former President Barack Obama, who I admire and respect, um, but I disagreed with him on this idea around um, the conversation of council culture. He was on this panel for the Obama Foundation, and he was basically talking about um, really criticizing, I think, millennials and Gen Zers about how, you know, there was no sense of, you know, people just wanted to cancel people they didn't agree with. And he made a situation based on disagreements. And I argued that there's more at stake in what drives people to counsel or call people out. And, and I think he, you know, people like himself that hold power, right? They oftentimes feel as though, you know, this, they, they're threatened by it, right? They're threatened by the collective pushing back on something they do. And so rather than just say there's strong disagreement, they say they're trying to counsel me. So it's, it's, it's really, you know, that type of scapegoat. In 2020, during the pandemic, I was a part of a YouTube show called Black Academic. And I was on there with some interesting personalities. Um, and there was one man in, in particular who, you know, claimed he was canceled and really wanted to make the argument that, oh, you know, it, 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 you know, cancel culture, you know, is getting rid of really good people and, and people are just not being able to have free speech. And I was so angered and annoyed by that, that idea, like he was making these really big sweeping generalizations that I, I remember talking to my book agent and being like, I know what I want to talk about. Like, I think a lot of people out here or victim blaming people for, 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 for calling people out for, for, for defending themselves. You know, when I think about the Me Too movement, when I think about Black Lives Matter, when I think about all of these people who are in these movements calling for change and, and justice, 
they're all being painted with this label um, that that paints them out to just go out and just want to harm people. But they're harming powerful people. They're they're actually trying to treat these people in a way that they deserve, right? They're trying to shift the narrative. They're trying to take back and reclaim power that was taken from them. And I just started to look through history and really began to look at the, some of the things that are being said in the media. And I noticed that most of the books on council culture has been written by either conservative voices or white cis head male voices that are all skewed towards this negative um, take on council culture. And I hadn't seen a book written by a black queer person like myself by a major you know, outlet like Macmillan and St. Saint, and Saint Martin's Press that gave a different perspective like mine. So that inspired me. That was the day I knew I wanted to write a book. And you know, throughout the pandemic, I started doing interviews and talking to different people. I talked to the co-founder of Mute R. Kelly, um, who, Kenetta Barnes, she's incredible. I speak to people like Leslie Mack. I speak to organizers like her. I talk to so many different voices in the industry that really give this book life. You know, Preston Mitchum, so many great names um, that made this book um, a reality. And I think that's good that you know you're kind of you're kind of shifting it. You know, like you said, everybody thinks cancel culture is bad, 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 but you know, you're you're going into a different lane. Um, you know, how how are you able to 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 process that message, let that message flow out to millennials, you know, because millennials are good for you know saying, oh, he canceled, she canceled, this, this, that. Um, how are you able to to put that out and, and let your let, you know let this be heard? Well, I think for me, it's about broadening the scale. Like I took a risk in that I wanted to explain that that there is no like identity connected to council culture outside of the fact that I define council culture essentially as people calling for the cancellation of something they find to be detrimental um, to their livelihood. And that goes from a conservative issue when they want to when they wanted to ban the Teletubbies when they want to ban books, right? They find these ideals to be, you know, something that's detrimental to them. Now, I personally disagree, but I also do not want to see, you know, colorism on TV. I don't want to see, you know, sexism and misogynoir. You know, I don't want to see those types of things. So when I call for the cancellation of, you know, imagery and, and, and individuals that are, that are speaking transphobia and other problematic things, that's because it's detrimenting people I care about and my livelihood, right? And I think what happens sometimes is that, I'll call it the Kevin Hart argument, that if a person like your movie, Kevin Hart, they're not trying to cancel you. If a person like your album and don't want to listen to it, they say it's not a good album, that's not cancel culture. Like people have conflated dissent and any type of dissent or disagreement as cancel culture. Cancel culture is a little bit more nuanced, more layered than that. So I give a good example. I always call it the McDonald's argument, right? So if I say, I tell my friends, I don't want to go to McDonald's because the food is nasty. I'm not trying to cancel McDonald's. You're not canceling McDonald's. That's just a matter of taste. But if I said, I don't want to go to McDonald's because they're not giving their employees livable wages. And I think that their, their mass production of meat is bad for the environment. That's cancel culture. And you know what? That's to me, not necessarily a negative thing. I think we put a negative tinge on every single person that seeks to counsel. Now, there are some people that are doing counsel culture in ways that are devious, but there's always been bad actors. I look at it in the same way that we look at, you know, weapons or guns or things, they're tools, how people interpret the use of them can change for various meanings, right? You can look at a knife and say, this is a tool to cut a sandwich. Someone can say it's a tool to stab someone. I look at these things are tools and in the hands of bad actors, bad things happen. In the hands of great actors, great things happen. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., Bayard Rustin, when they were trying to cancel Jim Crow segregation, that was cancel culture, y'all. It's not only when we see people we don't like. It, it can't be that when people we see that we don't like, can't, you know, seek to cancel we don't like, it's cancel culture. But when people are doing things we like, it's not. I argue that we need to neutralize this word and understand that it's a tool rather than one partisan issue over another. And, you know, of course, I, as everybody, if you got social media, you know, you've seen the latest person. It's, it's definitely Kanye West. People are talking about Kanye West every day. Yeah. Something. And all these, you know, all these brands that he's been partnered with are dropping them and things like that. Um, how do you view, do you view that as cancel culture or do you view that as, how do you view that? I absolutely do believe it's cancel culture. I think that 
any type of movement work that are around boycotts that are that are driven by social issues, that's also within the council culture framework. Um, I think in my book, which is very important that I say not all cancellations are the same. You know, when I'm having this conversation about Kanye West, I want to spell out the nuances and the intersectionality that comes sometimes gets ignored. Not everyone who do the same offense gets the same types of penalties and in, 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 in issues. I think about the fact that Kanye West had for, for a long time been saying sexist things, been saying misogynoir, noir, uh, saying negative things about Black women, been saying a lot of anti-Black things, and he was not canceled um, for that. But now he has gotten into bigger territory around, you know, he's offending wider masses. So now he's being anti-Black and anti-Semitic. So he just added on to his anti. And then there are people that said, okay, this is a cancelable offense. But when I think about people like Chrisette Michelle, she was canceled because she participated in the Trump inauguration. Was it the best move? No. But would she should she be canceled in, in, in ways that Kanye was able to wear a mega hat and wasn't? So I want to identify that even like every other system in our society, council, council, you know, council culture isn't always necessarily done fairly and justly in the same way for different people. There's nuances because humans are imperfect. And I think about Chrisette Michelle right now and the fact that, you know, there was a large swath of people that stopped going to her concerts, you know, stopped booking her. She she dealt with a lot of emotional and professional hardship based on that one decision she made. And when we look at people like Kanye West, he's made several bad decisions, but he's given a lot of grace because he's rich, because he's a man, because he was a bigger celebrity. And we see sexism in that. We see a lot of different types of uh, problematic tropes. That's the same way we look at the criminal justice system. We, we, we see all these flaws. And so cancel culture as a system is imperfect. You know, it's, it's not always assessing these things fair, but what other system has and so I think sometimes when people critique council culture, they will often say, well, well, what about this? And what about that? But you could say the same about every other institution in, on, on, on human earth. You know, it's always going to be someone getting a different share. But I think the necessity of it as a tool is still important because it gives those who are often, you know, not powered or not feeling as though they're represented a chance to step in when the courts don't step in. Like with Kanye, right? Kanye is not getting arrested. Kanye's not going to jail for the things he is saying and doing. And so when we don't have the courts, public opinion, when we, we, when we have activists and mobilizers and organizers and people, that is when they step in, when the courts don't step in. So we had to mute R. Kelly before a jury did. That's why cancel culture is a tool. It's a necessity because it allowed people like the Me Too co-founders, like Kinetta and others, to, to, to mobilize to, to shut down and deplatform problematic people like him and heart and in the Me Too movement, Tarana Burke with people like Harvey Weinstein. Like when you don't have the courts and you don't have the industries and you don't have capitalistic entities that's going to step in, the people do. And in council culture allows that. That's what makes the difference. Yeah. I want to ask you, once somebody is canceled, right? Is there a way that they can get uncanceled? And if so, how is that a pro how pro how's that process? How do you how do you think that works for somebody? That's <laughs> that's a fun question. In my book, you know, I don't I don't offer a solution because I think it varies based on people. And I and I didn't even try to provide that type of there's no one size fits all, just like there's no one size fits all in canceling, right? So in my book, I don't really try to create the a magic bullet. What I will say is that I think people need to read the room better. You know, personally, I think a lot of people are not reading the room. Read the room. Um, those who are powerful, like in my book, I make this very strong argument. I don't think everyday people are getting canceled. I want to be clear about that. I don't think everyday people are getting canceled. When people have said to me, well, what about that teacher who said this and got fired? She had a code of conduct. You know, like at your job, if you got fired from your job because you said something sexist or or anti-Black, you didn't get canceled. You violated your contract. You had rules. Powerful people in positions of power do not have rules oftentimes. If, what, if you're the CEO and founder of your own company, like Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like Mark Zuckerberg and some of these tech bros who just kind of do whatever they want to say, whatever they want, like Elon Musk right now, he is not constrained to the same rules as everyday people. So council culture comes in 
to, to hold people like that accountable in ways that they couldn't otherwise. And so to me, if we're talking about the ideas, I'm directing to people in power and in these institutions that are that could be canceled to read the room, to be more mindful, to be more respectful, to just be a better person. I find that more people who are, are given grace often in certain situations around council culture, they're sometimes given grace um, if they're more forthcoming, if they use their power for good, they shift narratives. There are situations where there is more grace to be given to them. We've seen people throughout time who have been canceled, but then have resurrected and have come back into the fold. We've seen this often. And I think that people can make mistakes and make bad judgments. And depending on who they are, and where they are with society, they can repair. You know, a good example is Bill Clinton. <laughs> Bill Clinton, you know, had a moment of cancel culture. But then, you know, a lot of time and, and image repair and also some white privilege, he's not necessarily counseled, right? But then you got people like George W. Bush, where arguably society still looks down on him. He's not totally counseled, but in many spaces, he doesn't have that same level of grace because honestly, what he did was, was massive. I think about Katrina, the wars, and some people don't, but that, that it varies, you know? And I think that we have to recognize that. But I would just say, to, to people in power, how to avoid being canceled, read the room, be more mindful, be respectful, check yourself, hold yourself accountable before the public has to. I want to ask you, wrapping it up, Ernest, you know, what is that one word that you that you can describe this book as? What, what, what's the one word that you, that you just think of when you think of this book? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> Mm, there's so many words. Oh my goodness. Transformative. Transformative. Why? Transformative. Um, I want to say radical, but transformative, you know, embodies all these different things. This is going to change the way people talk about this. This is going to be paradigm switching. This is going to be radical. This is going to really shake the table. And I think that transformative is that it's it, it already, you know, since the stuff with Kanye, this is the controversy with Kanye West right now, I'm seeing more people on social media when I discuss cancel culture warm up to this idea because they're recognizing that it's us as the people, as consumers, as advocates that we have to step up because these big industries will not listen. You know, when you think about, you know, those from the Jewish community and others, right, who called for boycotts of Kanye West, that was an individual individual who had influence, but he stepped up and said, listen, no, we got to stop right here. We have to do that more as people. We have to, we have, right? When we look at Black Lives Matter, there was a time where, you know, politicians treated Black Lives Matter at, at, at one point in time, Republicans and Democrats treated like it was a bad word. They couldn't say it. And companies did not want to affiliate themselves with that hashtag. But then look what happened in 2020, the summer of 2020. It seemed like everybody woke up and became a different person. Even though it was at that time, it didn't last that long to some degree. But in that moment, people automatically started changing their profiles and just got it. People started buying books on anti-racism and not calling it divisive or polarizing. Voices like mine that used to oftentimes be challenged or silenced or stifled, I got more of a platform to talk about these issues. And that came from people being sick and tired of being sick and tired, being fed up and just having enough, right? And I talk about people like Fannie Lou Hamer in my book of people who just had enough, you know? And, 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 and this is the part where every movement, there was always a more civil way. And I want people to know that in this book, I'm not advocating for riots and things. I'm advocating for people to utilize their, their given talent to 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 mobilize around their rage to speak truth to power and to hold people accountable and we don't do that enough sometimes because we're scared there's fear and i'll tell people silence is violence and right now if you want to use your voice to make a difference to challenge authority don't get dismayed by these terms like cancel culture let's reclaim cancel culture i'm reclaiming it i'm like Yes, if you're saying I want to cancel Kanye West for being problematic like he is, sure. 
Yes, this is council culture. That is fine. This book is a way for people, for, 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 for advocates. I dedicate this book to a lot of Black, queer, LGBTQIA activists and advocates, those who were at Stonewall before then and, and even after, who never let these terms stop them from fighting. So that's what inspires me. That's why I think this book is going to be transformative. And I cannot wait for people to read this in February 2023. I, it's, it's going to be a big deal. And I just can't wait for people to really just, just rethink this all together. This is dope. This is dope. I really love this, Ernest. And I want to thank you for coming on and speak with us. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're giving a, a different perspective, a, a clear perspective of what cancel culture really is. Because like you said, everybody throws the word out, but not everybody's getting canceled. Is that so? <laughs> so I want to thank you. Thank you for making this book. Thank you for putting your time and effort into this. Um, before you go, let the people know where I know you say in February 2023, but where they'll be able to find the book when they around the time they're taking pre-order now, where they can find you on social media right now, uh, you know, things like that. Absolutely. So the book comes out. Uh, February 21st, 2023, but pre-orders are open now where everywhere books are sold. You know, we have Amazon, you can go Barnes & Noble, you can support Black book owners, support local book owners. There's there's tons of places where you can find this book and pre-order it. You just put in Case for Council Culture on Google, there's an opportunity to pre-order it. And some other great news, I am the narrator of the audio book. I am narrating my first book. There is an audio book and I am the voice behind the case for council culture. So for those who listen to my podcast, who hear me all the time, I am going to be the voice of the book. So you can also now pre-order the audio book as well. And when the book comes out, everywhere books are sold, February 21st, you'll get a copy. You can hear my voice. It's there. It's all there. And People can find me on my website at ErnestOwens.com. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm verified. Put in Ernest Owens. It comes up. Follow me. I'll follow you back. And I'm excited for it. So just check out the book. Support it. You know, this as a first time Black queer author, you know, my entire experience in my book process for several years to make this happen has been a super success. I'm very grateful for my team and everyone who's been really behind this. And so, you know, the industry is listening to us right now. They're looking to hear different voices, millennial voices, black voices, queer voices, and all of the people in those identities all together. And books like this, first time authors like myself, all of the support um, is needed. So I, I wanna thank Rolling Out. I wanna thank you for just giving me this opportunity to talk about this book before it comes out because pre-press is important, pre-sales are important. And anyone who wants to do speaking engagements, talk about the book, I'm there. My information is on my website. Let's keep this conversation going. Thank you. Y'all heard it here first, man. Thank you so much, Ernest, for coming on, speaking with us about this book, everything that you're doing. We love everything you're doing here at Rolling Out. We appreciate you and thank you again. Make sure y'all go get that book. Make sure you pre-order it right now. Hey, up, cancel culture, get it right now. Thank you again, Ernest. Thank you. Always, always. Thank you, everybody, for checking us out. This is Rolling Out. Meet the author, your host, Malik Brown, my special